uh, Raytheon BBN, who will tell us about recent research and technology for scalable quantum computing. All right, thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. I uh, enjoyed the conference. Um, my name is Zach Dutton. <clears throat> I lead um, a, well, I'm from Raytheon BBN Technologies. Uh, we're a, a research and development government contracting firm. We've been around since the 1940s. Um, we're about 600 people, and we, um, we have been part of Raytheon since 2009, headquartered in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, we have offices here in Arlington, Virginia, and Columbia, Maryland, uh, as well as Newport, Rhode Island, and a few other remote offices. Um, <clears throat> I lead a business unit there uh, known as Physical Sciences and Systems, and included in that is the Quantum Engineering and Computing Group, um, and all the work I'm going to talk about today uh, uh, resides in that group. So <clears throat> what is that group? Uh, here's a not too outdated photo. It's about a year old, so it's not uh, quite up to date. Uh, but this is the gang, and we've been doing quantum information for quite some time. Uh, we actually got our start uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, we uh, actually implemented the first metropolitan scale quantum key distribution network uh, that uh, went live in 2005. We've continued to work on quantum network theory uh, in, the, in the years since. Um, the main, uh, you know, the biggest part of our effort has been in superconducting based quantum computing. Uh, and so we've been doing that at that for over 10 years. We have about 15 staff working on that. Um, and we do uh, many aspects of it, control electronics, qubit fab, software, um, amplifiers, et cetera. Um, but <clears throat> we're a fairly broad group. Uh, we span really all areas of quantum information, uh, including uh, theory, algorithms. We have a, a contingent that works on cryogenic computing and electronics for classical applications for low power um, computing. Uh, as well as quantum sensing, we did some of the seminal work in quantum illumination, which is the, uh, the idea behind uh, what's sometimes referred to as quantum radar. Um, <clears throat> and we also have uh, integrated photonics expertise applied to both quantum and uh, classical applications, um, and some quantum materials research, uh, uh, particularly in graphene. <clears throat> so, uh, what I'm going to talk about really is just the quantum uh, some aspects of the quantum computing work. And really, the way that we think about this uh, is really in terms of scalability and what kinds of technology are needed in scalability. And it's not just a, uh, uh, there's not just a, a single magic point. Uh, there's kind of scalability questions and scalability, scalability challenges kind of at every uh, stage of this process. Uh, and <clears throat> um, so just to give the context, you know, what we're coming on now, what we have are really systems coming on both at, um, in the commercial uh, world as well as in many government labs that are going to soon be reaching kind of the 50 qubit scale. And those are what I consider research scale systems. Um, there's going to be test beds. It's going to be a very exciting time because uh, it's going to allow us to actually test small scale algorithms and perhaps even more importantly, actually test error correction at, a, at an interesting scale where we can get very, very high fidelity logical qubits and see how it actually works with real errors. Um, these will be limited in performance. I have, uh, you know, I doubt that they'll have application, but they'll be a very, very important uh, research tool and a, and a point at which the rubber really meets the road for quantum computing. Then this next scale, which is very exciting, in which a lot of the commercial investment is really uh, advancing quickly, is going to be what I call small-scale quantum processors, order of 1,000 qubits. Um, that might be the point at which we have a commercial payoff for quantum computing. Um, optimization, machine learning, uh, these algorithms uh, that can be applied to those problems um, are really going to become possible once we get to that scale uh, and, and even be error corrected uh, possibly at that scale. And we will most likely have commercial-based resources based on the, the current trends. And there's a lot of things we can do to kind of use brute force and, and clever engineering to get to this kind of scale. But at some point, we're going to get to a point where the approaches we're taking are just not going to work. And there's real science that needs to be done to get beyond that. We're going to run into a brick wall. Um, and that's at the, you know, somewhere in the 1,000 to perhaps 10,000 qubit range. Somewhere in here, we're really going to be at a scale where we can do uh, true quantum computing with error correction. And if, these, um, you know, if we have success in these kinds of uh, applications, then this is where we'll really be able to get um, a true commercial payoff. 
Uh, and finally, large-scale systems, universal quantum computing at a scale of a million has been a, a long-term goal of the community. So how does BBN uh, kind of differ uh, in terms of uh, what we do every day and, and, and how we work compared to uh, many of, of the people here in academia? Well, there's a lot of similarities and a lot of overlap, but there's some very interesting um, uh, subtle differences in terms of the framework and, and how we choose our projects. And one of the things that we're always thinking about is ultimate uh, deployability and, and what can actually uh, be deployed at the end of the day. It's not that we're really interested necessarily in making that in commercial product, but we're very interested in tackling the challenges to make that possible, building those prototypes. And a lot of that has to do with looking at technologies that can be really be scaled and technologies that could allow things such as our superconducting based quantum computing um, processors to be scaled to that scale. So, um, and what's important to note is that it's not just one bottleneck like I put on the last slide, but there's things that come up at every uh, degree. And, and so what I'm gonna talk about is several projects, not all of these, but I'm gonna hit on a few of the projects going on in, in our group that are trying to attack these various challenges that will, will come into uh, play at various points. So <clears throat> some of them come in at, at really now, right? The, the, the things that we have now uh, are, are more than five qubits, and it's gonna take you know, good electronics to control things of that scale. Often that's the limiting uh, factor, not the number of qubits you can build, but the amount that you can control reliably. Uh, a very important challenge is verification and validation. Uh, as we all know, quantum process tomography is hopeless once you get to even five qubits um, or less. And so, um, what are methods that we can actually figure out what we're doing, how we're doing, and what's wrong with our quantum computer and how to debug it? Uh, randomized benchmarking doesn't give us enough information. Quantum process tomography is unscalable. What, what do we do about this problem? That's a problem now. Uh, the software stack, that's a problem now, and Chris hit on that <clears throat> uh, in, in his talk about Microsoft's work. Then there are things that are gonna be important very soon, and such as error correction. And for that, you need low latency digital feedback. That's something that we've uh, put a, a lot of uh, uh, research into. Um, and at these research scale machines where we could really demonstrate error correction at an interesting scale, that's gonna be an extremely important technology. <clears throat> and then there are things that are a little bit further out, but we need to be doing the science and development now. Um, so cryogenic digital electronics, I mentioned we're doing for classical applications. That's also going to be a way to control, um, control your quantum computer with electronics inside of your dilution refrigerator. And that will become important once uh, you get to a certain scale on, on the order of 1,000 where room temperature electronics is not going to be viable. And then looking even further out, what about when we get to a scale where we can no longer do our uh, process in one uh, dilution refrigerator, or perhaps we have multiple quantum computers, we actually want to connect them remotely over networks, uh, that's going to be <clears throat> uh, the point where we need to use optics to connect and network quantum computers. And so, for example, microwave optical quantum transduction is, is something we're very interested in uh, that is a key technology that needs to be um, uh, solved in order to make this possible. So, um, what are we doing about some of these problems? Um, you know, we don't necessarily have a, a kind of unified integrated framework, but we're really kind of attacking all of these problems um, um, because they're things that we say, see as, as extremely important going forward. So, one of the things we've put a lot of effort into over the last decade has been control, readout, and feedback electronics. Uh, one of the few commercial products we have is the BBN, BBN um, Arbitrary Pulse Sequencer. The APS2 is the current model. And this is a high-density uh, arbitrary waveform generator uh, to produce microwave pulses that are geared towards quantum computing applications uh, for our superconducting processors. Uh, we've put in a lot of, uh, <clears throat> a lot of features in the, uh, both the hardware and firmware to allow arbitrary control flow. We can get extremely long sequences, uh, we can get extremely fast feedback, and we can get uh, branching, which is an extremely non-trivial problem in this context, um, and high-speed high intermodule communications once you want to scale to multiple modules. Uh, this controls about, uh, this has about ten, um, controls about 10 qubits in one rack. <clears throat> uh, readout is another part of it, so you connect this with an FPGA. Uh, you can actually get digital processing on your readout, and get feedback, and this is what's going to be key to error correction. 
And finally, uh, Chris hit on as well the importance of, of, so of a software stack. We're working, uh, we've worked on the quantum gate language in order to do small scale physical control and compiling. And we're also looking at um, logical level um, compiling as well. And a lot of the details of, of uh, what we've developed are in this nice paper in um, Review of Scientific Instruments published a couple years ago. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, so a very huge problem is quantum characterization, as I, as I mentioned. Um, ultimately, what we'd like is quantum process tomography. That tells us everything we want to know. Um, but it's completely inefficient. It scales us 4 to the n, exponential. It's also corrupted by uh, spam. Um, it gives us full information, of course. Um, but it's, it's not an answer. Randomized benchmarking has been very popular. It's easy to implement. It's spam-free, which is a very, very nice feature. Um, and it's efficient. But it's efficient partly because it's telling you one number. It's telling you, rough, you know, in some way what your, your, your uh, gate fidelity is. Uh, but <clears throat> it's just one number, and it suppresses important um, error sources as well, so it can't be uh, fully trusted either. A step in the right direction has been the, the development of gate set tomography, uh, largely pioneered by uh, Sandia, who we've worked very closely with. Um, that gives you full information. It also gives you spam-free, uh, as opposed to quantum process tomography. But uh, it's also very inefficient um, and has some difficulty in implementation. So you know, what can we do? What can we do that it's kind of in between these that give us information that's useful uh, to diagnose our quantum processor without having this level of inefficiency? Um, so I mentioned GST, gate set tomography. Uh, it's difficult to implement, but it's possible to implement. And uh, that's one of the, the places in which our APS hardware uh, has become very um, useful. Um, so Sandia has a very, very nice um, uh, uh, software suite that allows you to design experiments and perform data analysis, uh, but to actually implement those takes extremely long sequences, and uh, our um, <laughs> control hardware infrastructure has been something that where we've been successfully been able to implement both one qubit and importantly two qubit um, gate set tomography. So, <clears throat> what can we do to make this more scalable? Uh, one thing that we've been very excited about um, and developed recently is pairwise perturbative ONSOTs, or PAPA for short. Uh, this work has largely been uh, led by Luke Govaya, uh, who's here in the audience. If there's any questions, I'm sure I'll defer to him. Uh, but the idea is, of course, GST doesn't scale efficiently. And what we proposed is an ONSOTs where we look at pairwise um, uh, behavior. And so we diagnose this process uh, matrix into things uh, that are a product of each of the pairs of qubits. And this has ultimately an efficient polynomial uh, with number of qubits uh, scaling to it. It's also physically motivated <coughs> in the way we construct the ensembles. Um, and so one of the recent experiments uh, that's been very promising, and this was presented at the APS meeting this year, uh, was to look at PAPA with our GST uh, data and, and, and see how it did. And what we found is that for every gate that we looked at, um, for every process that we looked at, um, it, it performed very well. Um, unfortunately, we're in a regime where we can't even do quantum process tomography, so we can't really compare to ground truth, uh, even in this case. Uh, the best that we could do um, here was to look at uh, how it compared to ideal gates, uh, which, of course, we don't have, but, um, but it was beating those by substantial margins, which is a sign that it's capturing uh, the kinds of errors accurately. Um, and we have looked at other simple models. We don't have a systematic uh, analysis of, of, at this level of detail, but we have looked at other simple error models, and PAPA has, has beat every one that we have um, looked at. So we're very excited of, that this might be a path forward to scalable, spam-free um, uh, way of getting at detailed process information as we move to three, four, five qubits, et cetera. <clears throat> so I mentioned hardware for real-time error correction. Uh, that's where the FPGA comes in, and that's where you need low light latency digital feedback. Um, so we have uh, really worked hard over the years in minimizing this uh, processing and uh, the many steps necessary to go from your readout um, to your FPGA, whoops, Yikes. 
um, back into your uh, pulse sequencer, uh, and finally back out to your qubits. And this total closed loop cycle is 800 nanoseconds. We can do a little bit better than that, but it's actually quite close to what we believe is the, is the, is the fundamental limit. Um, and that's good enough uh, uh, in, uh, for many, for many error, error correction uh, protocols. Uh, and in fact, as a simple demonstration of this, we've looked at a real-time repetition code. Um, so this is not full error correction, but just look at a, a simple uh, majority vote of three qubits. Uh, do your CNOTs in order to get your uh, um, uh, ancilla diagnostics and <clears throat> use a polyframe tracker. So we implement this on a five qubit device. And the results here aren't great in absolute terms in terms of uh, fidelities. We had so-so uh, coherence times. More importantly, we had very bad readout on these, um, uh, which is dominating the air. But the important thing is that the feedback electronics is doing almost uh, perfectly what it needs to be doing. So you look at an uncorrected, um, after a number of cycles through this, you look at uncorrected qubits, and they're decaying very rapidly to some uh, performance around 0.4 after 8. If you cheated and you did uh, post-processing, you could you find that you would do a little bit um, that you would do better, and so this is what you want to be doing once you do this majority vote um, uh, error correction. And what we found is that when we implemented the real-time feedback, uh, we essentially matched what you would do if you cheated and did the, the post-processing. So the feedback electronics um, is a nice proof of principle that it's really doing its job. Uh, and we're looking forward to uh, testing this on, on with, with better readout uh, going forward. Uh, so the final topic I want to touch on is something that's, again, a lot further out, but the research questions are here today of how do you do optical microwave transduction? And this will be important when you want to connect uh, some, perhaps nearby, but more importantly, uh, f um, quantum processors that are far apart. Uh, two different dilution refrigerators, or even interfacing between various kinds of qubits, uh, ions, and uh, superconductors, of course, for example. And one approach has been mechanical oscillators, uh, a very clever approach that was um, proposed by Mon Kei Song about a decade ago now, was <clears throat> to really just put, uh, use a microwave cavity and an optical cavity, uh, and and then use some nonlinear uh, non material like lithium niobate that already does electro-optic transduction uh, and do it in a quantum regime because you put it in these cavities. Uh, this is a, a more, perhaps a more robust uh, uh, method, a more um, um, manufacturable um, um, method than, than some of the mechanical oscillator approaches. There are, of course, major challenges, bandwidth and efficiency uh, being the main ones. And this has actually been experimentally demonstrated in the non-quantum regime uh, at JPL um, around the same time. So uh, early on, we found that one of the issues with the, was this was you had your free, your free spectral range, the, the spacing of your, your comb lines, uh, basically the microwave frequency, uh, was exactly, of course, by design matched to your, um, uh, to your optical comb line splitting. And that meant that you had to detune in order to prevent all the comb lines uh, from essentially um, uh, participating in this process. Uh, it reduced your efficiency. It led to some uh, noise from this, um, uh, from this next nearest neighbor. And so our new scheme uh, that we proposed with, with uh, Marco Lunker at Harvard was to look at um, a double uh, ring structure. And that allows you to essentially decouple these two frequency scales. And uh, we have not uh, gotten to this experiment yet, but the analysis shows that we will get much better performance. And so essentially, we have a way of, um, of, of solving this problem that we're looking forward to implementing soon, uh, which will really allow essentially a monolithic, monolithic quantum transduction chip. This is all uh, an integrated photonic device. Uh, and our initial analysis shows that we'll get, you know, these are not super fast, but these are on order of 10 kilohertz. And um, it's a good starting point. And it's, you know, uh, there's still a lot of open questions about whether that's good enough, of course, to, um, uh, to really support distributed quantum computing. Uh, but it's certainly in the ballpark of something that would be interesting. Uh, and, and we're looking forward to, to developing that technology. So I'll just conclude by putting up the summary of uh, touch on some of the topics I talked about. I feel pretty incompetent because I left out the most important slide that the other two speakers, which is that we're hiring. 
Uh, so we're hiring, in particular, uh, relevant to this theory audience, uh, we're especially looking for uh, theorists uh, with quantum characterization uh, interest and expertise. So uh, please talk to Luke Govaya or myself uh, if you're interested. Questions? <laughs> yeah, so it just got obscured here, but, but for a thousand qubits, you cited as a need um, to put the control electronics inside of a dill fridge. Um, can you comment on why you don't think the control electronics would work at room temperature at that scale? Uh, there's, it really has to do with uh, some of the mechanical, a lot of it is mechanical issues. So you look at heat load, uh, you look at wire count, a lot of these things will actually be the, the bottlenecks once you get to a scale above several hundred qubits. Um, it's not clear when that, that will come in, but many people believe at 1,000 you'll, you'll really need to be putting electronics inside. And you can. We do have the technology. Uh, and if you can increase your mechanical reliability by doing that, and you have reliable um, um, uh, cryogenic electronics to control them, it's certainly worth doing. More questions? I just wanted to, to clarify something you, you skipped over quite quickly. You mentioned that you had this quantum gate language and you said you're a kind of compiler. So are you compiling from the gate language into control pulses or you have some higher level language com compiling to gates? It's compiling into, um, into um, uh, pulse sequences. So it's, it's, a short, it's a script in order to say I have this many qubits, I want to do these gates, and then it, it turns it into a long uh, pulse sequence. Okay, thanks. Okay, one more question. So you mentioned at one point about the differences with academia. If you had to give an elevator pitch and convince someone to take a position at BBN over an academic position, uh, what would you say? Uh, I would say that you have a very um, you have a very diverse and strong team uh, that that works together. There's a, there's many projects that you can work on. Uh, it's very entrepreneurial. Uh, if you have a passion and you can get funding from a government agency, uh, you can do that. If you want to work on a particular technical thing that someone else is, is leading, you can do that as well. It's a very team-oriented, uh, it's a good balance of, of team-oriented as well as entrepreneurial. And many people, so I, I kind of was in academia, you know, early in my career, of course. Um, for me, at some point, I, I became less motivated by uh, just the endpoint being the the nature paper, but I kind of like the endpoint to be, you know, a much bigger system or a much uh, solving some engineering challenge that might not be uh, the 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 biggest scientific discovery, but is a very difficult challenge that everyone's trying to solve and then make something new possible. Okay, great. Let's uh, let's thank Zach again. <laughs>